tell her to start digging a hole, see, <laughs> see if it matches up with the theory. Have you seen their map? I always thought it was like the pull down map, like how we always see it, but it's not. They, they have the North Pole in the center of their map, and then the South Pole is the entire boundary of their map. So Antarctica is the boundary of their whole entire map. So, it's like a, so if you, they, there's a YouTube video where they take a magnet, <laughs> they put it in, this, in the North Pole, and then they take a compass and go around it and say, look, it always points to the north and always to the south, so it's got to be true. And I'm like, well, that magnet that you're using isn't a north pole, it's a north pole and south pole, which is why it's doing that. If you were to hold it like this and go around, it would point straight away. So now I've got to make a YouTube video to prove it wrong. Now I'm just, it's my life goal now to prove the earth isn't flat. <laughs> That's <laughs> Huh? I was creative enough. I just be one. Do that as well, though. Yes, yes. Before we, before we go to, um, come up with decent excuse for it. Can it be distributed it's like six pay or four pages per per person, and it should be enough for each of us. So today, John will practice his um, doctor of thesis. Talk and before I will quickly go over the things that uh, we started last time but didn't finish. So uh, it's about uh, getting to Senegal. Yes. I registered early. Did, did you register? Yep. Okay. And it, it works. You uh, check that it works without pain, right? Yeah, yeah, I did the same thing as last year. So you need to, they need to have confirmation in writing um, two weeks prior. So if I, I'm not going to be able to go, I'll just have to send them a, a letter by the end of January. It should be okay. Okay. Yeah, I think it is a good uh, plan for everyone and... Uh, did anyone else register? We did. So we'll uh, navigate. If there will be any newcomers, we will navigate uh, them to you as experts in uh, registering for free. So last time we did uh, finish at um, registering, and here are the titles that uh, you may use for uh, including as a keywords in your abstracts and in uh, titles to... That's a different sessions or what? Please. It's a conference on all the subjects. All the subjects. But they will be mix and match. Ah, okay, so it's not going to be like separate sessions. Really. No, it may be, will be one invited talk on... on uh, probably it's just titles on, of invited talks. And simple people will uh, do contributed talks or posters, posters that most more or less match this stuff. So um, the um, error registration on November 30th is here is how to register. It was recently updated. So um, if you attend, oops, they just restarted the whole system. You have to. Weird. Oh. This is our favorite part of the of oh, the meeting. Wow. Especially see it, it, it uh, yeah. there is a wow. uh, <laughs> find it uh, speed of light and <laughs> going through circuits. <laughs> Enjoying that stuff. If you attend this conference uh, like more than five times, you start getting uh, personal invitations. Don't, not to forget about it. So the upon you register, you uh, you will get the link where to submit the abstract. If you didn't say, um, like they want to prevent submission without registration. Ah, that's the way it goes. Yes, Maybe yes. Otherwise, the system first you register and then there are going yeah. to be a link. Other, so otherwise, the system okay. will, will be flooded. So, and if you go on the 
So prepare for su surprise if you didn't register, if you, re uh, if you didn't submit the abstract. If you did, you're fine. Is there anyone who didn't submit the abstract? I haven't submitted mine yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> so when you go to the abstract, you select for the Sustainable Symposium, and you think everything will be normal. You just uh, create your name and, and password, log, log in, S uh, click on to submit the abstract, type in the title, select whatever. If you're um, typically we are hunting for posters, but and uh, plenary and invited goes only this invitation. But uh, some of us were very brave last year and submitted for oral contribution. <laughs> It's like for advanced scientists. <laughs> brave or naive. <laughs> but it worked? Yes. Really? So, uh, Dane, Dane got an uh, oral presentation two months after he joined the group. Yeah. And uh, got introduced <laughs> as a doctor. Yeah. So, if, if you want a little bit more of honor, <laughs> and if you want uh, people torturing you with questions in public rather than one to one imposter, you can select this uh, oral contributed. But then, after you you click here, submit the uh, and stuff, they will check that you are a real human. So they want to uh, select. Well, maybe questions are different. For me, it was identify which part of the of the image uh, are street signs, and then uh, you get things uh, registered, and uh, probably it will be placed in the in the book of abstracts. Okay, so as a backup, I can bring up the PDF of uh, uh, this if the connection goes. Slower than than we need than we want, but I, I hope that there will be no problems with connection and, and John will uh, take over and uh, uh, forward his um, content to our screen. So please do not. We have time until six for record, recording things. Please make uh, notes on this uh, piece of paper. Be as critical and uh, aggressive as you can. It's better to experience it now rather than uh, during the uh, formal defense, which is in two days. John, floor is yours. Okay. Um. All right, is it full screen for you guys? It's black screen for us now. Okay, hold on. Then I'm gonna do this differently. All right, now is it full screen? Yes. Okay. All right, well, thank you guys for um, coming to listen one more time um, to this practice talk. So the title, um, is non-adiabatic dynamics in quantum confined semiconductors. Um, and so um, just briefly uh, what I will be going through, um, I'll give you a little bit of introduction and motivation as to why uh, we're looking at these topics. Um, and then uh, a look at the methodology of how we're interested or how we're interested in studying these topics. And then going into uh, some more of the specifics for um, the chemical systems um, of interest for us that we've looked at over the past um, couple years, and then we'll wrap it up um, and try and conclude with some final thoughts. So one of the main things we're interested um, in are electronic processes for um, applications that uh, take some type of uh, solar energy um, or renewable energy uh, conversion. And so things such as photovoltaic cells, um, photocatalysis, things um, that harness a chemical composition of a material to take the energy from a photon and turn it into um, electrical energy, which we can use um, for our day-to-day -day living. And so uh, some of the other opportunities uh, for use of 
um, semiconductor materials um, are for optoelectronics, um, different light emitting devices, basically the inverse process of what um, capturing solar energy is. And so um, there are different types of electronic processes um, that can occur following some type of photo excitation um, in which we're interested in. Uh, one thing um, to know is that for multiple different types of relaxation mechanisms um, within the same system, they're all gonna be competing with one another. Um, so it's important to um, know what types of mechanisms may occur, um, what the tip relative time scales are, um, so we can kind of determine um, what type of event may be more probable um, than the others. Um, and so just... Oh no, so it's happened. Therefore, we don't have Skype defenses. <laughs> Do you on Thursday this week? Yes. Which German side or our side? Having problems. It's, it's his side. It's because side. he's on. Uh, see, he's sitting on a coach. Which means he's on wireless. And second, he's using home internet, which depends on the company. I'll send him an email just in case he didn't realize that he's not in there. Yeah. So he, now, now he realized that he is not connected and he reconnect but <laughs> You are the only participant in the conference. So uh, our backup solution, if John did, um, he was planning to uh, drive here, but uh, the roads were icy and we decided that it's ah. safer to stay alive before the defense. Okay, I see. Um, so, if he didn't connect at all, we just sit and read his uh, slides. I can try to present instead of him, but it will not help him. <laughs> um, we can put him on the speakerphone, you know, you can call him yes, then. Yes. Just look at his slides. Okay. Thanks for coming. Yes. Now everyone is here. Oh, yes. You know this effect, right?
you freeze and you didn't reconnect. Okay. So if you were right. speaking for the last five minutes, we didn't hear you. <laughs> so uh, please try to reconnect and if uh, as a backup um, if it will not work you just speak through through Skype. I thought I thought I was doing so well, nobody interrupted me or anything. <laughs> <laughs> you were thinking I am so perfect. <laughs> okay, what was I gonna say? I mean I'm using So if, if you are bored to wait until technical things are resolved, you can uh, just read and develop comments. Because, uh, It sounds like connection problems, not the not the software. Sure, even the, through the cell phone. Through the three G doesn't work. No, it is Skype. Cell phone is the last resort. Okay. Oh hey. We okay. See. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. You, you, you should ask it after each slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, maybe what I will do then is. Um, Um, okay. Well, can you still see uh, the slides here? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I'll probably just, oh, well, I'll probably do it this way. That way I can kind of see um, if things are moving on. Um, okay. Yes. We lost you yeah. on slide five. Yep. Okay. Um, at the beginning of slide five or at the end of slide five? Probably the beginning. <laughs> 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 Okay. Um, all right, where was I? Okay, so um, I was talking about uh, different types of electronic processes occurring in uh, photovoltaic and optoelectronic uh, devices um, and the fact that we're interested in these type of, of uh, mechanisms because they can dictate um, or predict what's going to happen. And if we make a material modification, um, can we make that process more efficient? And so here on this slide, um, we're looking at two cartoon pictures uh, that highlight a number of different uh, electronic processes that may happen in a material. Um, in the left figure, uh, there's a blue vertical arrow going up, uh, representing some type of absorption. Um, and then there's also um, various uh, arrows coming down. 
So black squiggly lines um, represent some type of um, uh, non-radiative event, um, whereas colored lines uh, going down represent radiative. And so uh, internal conversion um, or um, electron cooling or non-radiative relaxation um, are a number of names for uh, this type of process, um, which we're interested in and we're able to calculate. And so um, other types of radiative processes which we're interested in are fluorescence. Um, and because we're, we're looking primarily at um, non-spin polarized materials, um, these are the two processes that we would say occur most readily. Um, and then uh, in the picture on the right, uh, there's a couple different uh, highlighted processes. Um, so you see the very first one on the left with an R cooling, so this is the same type of non-radiative relaxation where there's just an excited electron um, that loses its energy through vibration um, and relaxes down. Um, a second type um, of excitation or event that can happen is there's an excited electron, um, but instead of losing its energy radiatively or non-radiatively, um, it promotes a second electron up, and so you're uh, taking one type of um, excited charge carrier and turning it into two, um, also known as some type of um, or multiple exciton generation. Um, a third option is you can have a, a high energy excitation, and before any type of relaxation event occurs, this charge can be collected out um, either through a secondary material um, or directly to an electrode, um, which can increase uh, the photovoltage um, of the process. So um, those are the things that we're interested in and, and kind of the why um, as to what we're, we're um, excited about. And so the next thing is, is how are we looking into these types of events? Um, if you want to measure ultra fast events and different types of electronic processes, um, it can get to be a very expensive lab setup um, and something that can uh, be very hard to do um, so the approach um, that we've taken is we're using computational methods um, and computer softwares uh, to look at a range of these electronic relaxation mechanisms in a, a number of different materials um, rather than um, spending years uh, setting up and, and perfecting um, one type of um, uh, measuring uh, technique. So the first thing that's going to um, happen is we'll find we'll find a problem or material that we're interested in, um, and we'll be able to build a model of it. And so we'll take this computational model um, and place specific atoms in an arrangement uh, that simulates the chemical system, and we'll want to optimize uh, this structure. And so the optimization is is a process in which um, all the atoms are shifted slightly. Um, and an energy is calculated. And so every time the atoms are shifted, the energy gets recalculated, and this is done repetitively until um, the lowest possible energy configuration is found or until um, the total energy hits some sort of threshold that we're happy with um, and we think is close enough to um, the, the lowest energy configuration. And so these total energies are dependent on um, the locations and the densities of the electrons, which are also um, are dependent on the atomic positions. And so um, finding the optimization provides the total energy, um, but it also gives um, the solution of the one electron Cohn-Sham equation um, in a basis of Cohn-Sham orbitals, um, and also uh, the corresponding energies for each of these orbitals. And so, um, the first way that we can um, sit and take a look at what does the electronic structure look like in the material uh, is to look at a density of states. And so the density of states describes um, where in energy are the available electronic states um, that may or may not be populated. And so the spectra on the bottom left uh, shows um, a red filled set of energy states, which um, is the valence band. Um, and then there's an unfilled empty set of states um, which is the conduction band within the system. And so um, having um, an idea of, of how the states are uh, relatively separated and sorted uh, can give us an indication of um, what types of optical energies are gonna be needed to uh, promote um, an excitation um, and also uh, corresponding emission events. And so uh, that leads us to the next step of 
we're interested in what the absorption spectra of a system might be. And so um, the first step in this is calculating the transition dipole moment, um, which is presented here as Dij. Um, and it's a, um, the, um, a dependence on the spatial configuration of uh, two specific Konsham orbitals um, and the electron density um, of them. And so here we're interested in um, one transition between two uh, separate orbitals. Um, and this is also um, done in an approximation of independent orbitals. Um, so we're not necessarily interested in a superposition of uh, transitions for one excitation energy, um, but solely looking at these two states. And so this transition dipole moment is then used in calculating the oscillator strength, Fij, um, which is then used as a weighting factor uh, to provide the absorption um, for that specific transition. Okay. And so um, this is uh, the, well, this is the basic uh, ground state um, non-spin polarized type of electronic structure calculation, um, but there are also other types of um, methods uh, for calculating the ground state that can be used. And these are done by um, installing VASP with different builds um, to produce them. And so um, this is just a comment now. Um, this slide, and um, I forgot to build one for spin polarized. Um, so I'm gonna give a, a general summation um, um, of the two methods and then uh, rebuild these two. So the other two methods that um, we're interested in are uh, spin polarized type calculations. And so when we're interested in, in um, electronic uh, configuration that produces uh, triplet and uh, doublet type um, electronic states, this type of spin polarized calculation can provide us with information on how the two spins um, may uh, differ in uh, their possible energy states that can be um, sampled, um, and also the absorption and emission events that may occur um, specifically in those uh, two uh, spin states. A third type of calculation, um, which goes even further than the spin polarized calculation, um, are non-collinear spin um, calculations. And so uh, specifically for the cases in which I'm interested in, uh, this is needed because uh, specific materials with heavy elements uh, require uh, the implementation of spin orbit coupling calculations. And so uh, the results of the nonclinear spin um, uh, calculations are provided again in the or or in the basis of cone jump orbitals, but instead of uh, these orbitals being um, dependent on only one electron and one spin, um, they're a two component type uh, cone chum wave function dependent on both uh, types of spins uh, resulting in um, a superposition of, of, of two different orbitals um, and an energy that is uh, separate than just the two spin components uh, comprising um, this non-collinear wave function. And so uh, with the solution of these different um, spin polarized and non-collinear spin wave functions, um, we can use them in the same type of process I described for finding uh, the absorption um, of a material. So when we've looked at uh, the ground state uh, electronic structure of a material, uh, what we're interested when we're interested in um, different electronic relaxation mechanisms, there needs to be uh, atomic motion. For any type of non-radiative transition that's uh, facilitated by nuclear motion, uh, we need to somehow simulate um, how these materials are moving um, at an atomistic level. And so to do this, uh, we run uh, heating and molecular dynamic calculations um, set for some specific temperature that we, we desire to know about. And so um, we'll, we're able to uh, take our optimized structure, uh, set um, our ambient temperature, and allow this um, 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 set of atoms to be, uh, have their velocities rescaled to try to um, come up and equilibrate with uh, the energy for a given temperature. And so once we were happy with um, a sustained energy uh, for the specific temperature, we're able to take the velocities 
um, of the atoms and use them as the first step um, form like the dynamic trajectory. And so uh, we're able to let uh, a molecular dynamic simulation run um, along a ground state trajectory and record atomic positions um, at a specific time interval uh, for generally uh, one picosecond. And so one of the results um, in combining the absorption calculations and also our molecular dynamic simulations is that we can look at a molecular dynamic photoluminescence result. And so what I'm showing on the screen are um, the fluctuations of uh, cone sham orbital energies, um, which were the solution uh, to our initial optimization. And so um, if we would pick um, the HOMO and the LUMO as our two orbitals in which we're interested of the transition, um, we can calculate the absorption, the oscillator strength and the absorption value um, at each, inch, each instant of time. And then if we look at a total summation or time average um, along the entirety of the trajectory, what we're able to do is to get some type of um, uh, emission spectra taking into account the nuclear motion of the system. And so this can solve uh, for issues seen in um, uh, band, or, uh, line widths of uh, calculated spectra that are too thin um, and uh, account for the inhomogeneous broadening. And so uh, moving forward from that, uh, we haven't even discussed um, the, the types of, of non-radiative relaxation, um, which I mentioned in one of the previous, one of the very first slides. Um, and so to do that, um, again, we use uh, the individual wave functions um, that we calculate along the molecular dynamic trajectory, and we do a comparison uh, between the two, which would result in our non adiabatic coupling values. And so here um, you can see in the middle uh, image, there's, um, there are gray looking walls. And so it for each of those gray walls is one instant of time along the molecular dynamic trajectory. And so at each of those time steps, we calculate the total wave function and we look at how um, the overlap or how the wave functions compare from one adjacent time step to another. And in between time steps, uh, this produces um, the niabatic coupling value. And so this is again uh, represented in the right image where if you would just take one vertical cut as an instant of time, and compare it with the adjacent um, that provides a coupling. And so once we have um, this type of non abatic coupling calculated, um, we need to uh, take that um, and try to use it towards the end goal of calculating out um, rates of non radiative relaxation. And so taking an autocorrelation of this non abatic coupling um, and then performing a Fourier transform uh, provides us with um, components that make up uh, the red field tensor. And so um, this red field tensor um, allows us to find um, the relative uh, transitions um, for non-radiative process between individual sets of, um, of, of orbitals that we're interested in. And so, um, this red field tensor um, is also used um, within, uh, or used as a parameter uh, within the equation of motion for the electronic degrees of freedom. And so uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the nuclear motion um, and see how the motions themselves um, affect or direct um, the electronic uh, system themselves and how the transitions are going to vary depending on uh, what types of motion are available. And so we're able to look at how the, uh, the electron density matrix is going to change in time in relation to uh, the nuclear motions um, of the system. And so um, once we are provided with um, this type of solution with uh, the Redfield um, and the Louisville superoperators, we're able to diagonalize it, producing um, uh, um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors um, for the system. 
and use these in, in solving for expansion coefficients um, for some initial excitation um, or initial condition that we're interested in. And so what we're able to produce from this type of calculation are a couple different things. Uh, primarily, we're interested in the non-radiative relaxation uh, dynamics uh, shown in blue, um, but we can also take out um, other types of information about photoluminescence events um, and look at a time-dependent photoluminescence. And so um, if we're interested in the non-radiative relaxation rates, um, so like I said, we can take some type of initial condition uh, for specific electronic relaxation um, and then allow uh, the dynamics to um, move the charge um, in space and time. Um, but what we're really interested in um, is, is solving for, well, is the, the energies of each car charge carriers um, during the migration. And so by calculating the um, expectation values of energy, um, we're able to normalize them and then fit um, or find a fit for uh, this average expectation value um, and then find a rate corresponding to this fit. Um, and so that's given as Ke um, down in the bottom right. Um, and it's also the same for holes um, as we don't um, treat them. Uh, well, well, they're not treated uh, with any interaction between them, uh, but they're all they're treated exactly the same. They're through the same formalism. And so, um, once we have uh, an idea of, of, of how uh, the charges are moving in time, um, how this density matrix is evolving, um, we're able to calculate where in energy they are, and we're uh, able to calculate uh, the transition uh, possibilities during the trajectory. And so here, with a time integrated photoluminescence, for each instant of time, looking where the electron and hole are, we can calculate the relative energy difference and the oscillator strength for the transition and integrate all emission events along the trajectory. So the last, um, the last type of uh, methodology that I want to highlight um, is a multi-exciton generation process. And so uh, this is a process in which um, I initially mentioned we have one high energy excitation, um, and so the high energy electron uh, before uh, decaying through non-radiative or radiative processes um, can interact with a secondary um, charge carrier to produce a second electron. And so um, this calculation is done, um, well, done by a collaborator we have um, and applied to uh, one of our uh, perovskite materials themselves. And so um, the main things uh, to highlight within this type of calculation um, are uh, the volume of the simulation cell, uh, looking at transition density, um, and um, the Coulomb and momentum space, um, as well as making sure um, that it abides um, uh, by rules of conservation, uh, looking at the residence condition and density of final states. John? Yes. Sorry to, to interrupt. Um, several places in your talk mm -hmm. induce a wish to ask you about Fermi's golden rule. Okay. Do not answer now to save time, but be ready to address it or to refer to it in several places. Okay. How, how this equation is connected to Fermi's golden rule? Okay. Okay. And so, um, in moving from how uh, we're interested in, or how we're going to approach these types of, of problems and looking at uh, the dynamics uh, within a system. Um, I haven't really mentioned too much anything about the actual confinement um, of re effects uh, stemming from uh, spatially restricting how big a, a material can be. And so when we move uh, from a bulk regime to a quantum confined regime, um, there are a number of, of basic principles um, 
that can modify the electronic structure of the system. And so uh, this is an incomplete slide. Um, but when we're thinking about uh, what happens to an electronic structure when the system is confined, um, we end up with larger energy spacings um, within the material. So this uh, discretization of states um, prompts the opening of band gaps um, and increases uh, the energies uh, between um, adjacent electronic states, which also affect uh, rates of non-radiative relaxation. A second thing um, is because these materials become so small, um, they can they can get to um, a size where they're smaller than the exciton bore radius, and so uh, this is the relative size of an excited electron and hole. Um, and so when the material is bigger than this radius, um, you can have delocalization um, um, or more of a delocalized state uh, for the X time. But when you start confining it, um, it can provide, or it can pre, um, what's where I'm looking for? Um, it can prompt um, various interactions that wouldn't normally occur um, within the material. And so here, um, we're interested in a number of possible effects uh, stemming from different or stemming from spatial confinement within a, a range of materials. And so, one of the things that we can look at are uh, well, one of the things we can look at is uh, the mic microstructure of a system. Um, when we keep reducing the size of a nanocrystal, um, what happens to the specific coordinations um, of the atoms, and how does that affect um, observables? Um, for example, how does um, decreasing size of a nanocrystal uh, modify uh, photolum photoluminescence? Um, and also, how does a uh, change in temperature modify the photoluminescence in these small materials? Um, I mentioned energy spacing. Um, how can we uh, utilize opening band gaps um, and separating states um, to our benefit? Um, we may be able to take these openings and gaps um, and functionalize surfaces to add new energy states, um, which can promote new types of uh, new relaxation pathways within the material. Um, I also mentioned with the energy spacing, the um, energy difference between adjacent states with this type of, of energy spacing um, process such as non radio relaxation um, are expected to decrease. And so you're going to have a change in uh, the rates for specific processes just by uh, confining a material. Um, and corresponding to that, if you uh, start to slow down one process, is it um, are you able to um, possibly promote a secondary process to be the dominant relaxation pathway? So to look at changing the microstructure, um, there was um, a study done by collaborators of ours uh, looking at uh, the change in photoluminescence with temperature and silicon nanocrystals. And so uh, we looked at three different uh, diameter uh, silicon nanocrystals shown on the right, uh, ranging anywhere from close to one to two nanometers. And so um, in terms of addressing how does the microstructure play into this type of luminescence change, um, we can highlight the different coordinations of the silicon atoms within the system. And so on the left, you can see there are um, silicon atoms coordinated to their four other silica circled in green. Um, there's a silicon coordinated to two other silica and two hydrogen circled in blue. And then there's a silica coordinated to three silica and one hydrogen in red. And so the varying levels of coordination for the silicon atoms um, are going to uh, directly affect the amount or affect um, the forces felt during molecular dynamics. Um, and possibly restrict uh, certain motions uh, for the materials. And so one thing uh, that happens um, and is more pronounced in, in very small materials is the percentage of um, silicon atoms that are make, well, that make up the surface. And so the surface atom percentage can be seen um, going from about 83% for the smallest silicon uh, nanocrystal down to 43, 44% uh, for the largest one. And so um, during dynamic calculations, um, we're able to look at both um, 
the total movement of the atoms themselves and also the corresponding energies within the electronic structure. So on the left, we have uh, the three models um, for both a low temperature 77 Kelvin and high temperature 300 Kelvin molecular dynamic trajectory. Um, and so these images are a superposition of all atomic coordinates along the, mo the molecular dynamic trajectory. And you can see that for the high temperature, there's a much greater fluctuation away from that um, geometry equilibrium uh, calculated during optimization. And so corresponding with um, these types of uh, motions are the fluctuations in energy. And so um, the low temperature uh, versus high temperature energy fluctuations show that for low temperature, there's uh, not as pronounced uh, amplitude of fluctuation in the energies. Um, and there's also an opening of um, a subgap in the conduction band um, up above uh, minus three electron volts. And so um, the maintenance of, or maintaining this, this subgap, um, and also the fact that for high temperature uh, fluctuations, you can see that the band gap closes slightly uh, just because you have um, um, energies going up and down, uh, changing where the band, uh, band edges lie. And so based on this uh, information, uh, we can calculate the dynamic, uh, molecular dynamic photoluminescence for this three sets of materials at the two different temperatures. And so for the low temperatures uh, shown in the left panel in solid lines, you can see that the intensity is greater than um, that calculated for the high temperature uh, trajectory, which is the dotted lines. And so um, how is it that we can uh, possibly look to um, explain how the microstructure can directly influence uh, the photoluminescence of the material. And so um, the plot on the uh, top right um, is, a, is a visual representation of, of looking at the exact values of um, total change in intensity, um, the intensity maxes, uh, as a function of diameter for the material. And so the blue line plotted there um, is a relative ratio um, between intensity maxes um, for the materials themselves um, relative to uh, the initial intensity. Um, and then the red is a second fit in trying to account for how does the percentage of surface atoms um, play into um, what the projected intensity change might be for a given temperature change. And so you can see that the trends between um, both of these fits is relatively um, similar, um, uh, identifying that indeed there is some type of correlation between um, how, um, how many of the atoms are, are are greatly fluctuating um, and, its, and its direct effect on the photoluminescence of the material. Okay. And so um, the second thing uh, that we kind of want to mention um, and also alluded to in the Konchan energy fluctuations is the fact that um, band gap energies are going to change as a function of size within the material. And so what I'm showing here um, are three density of state plots for the silicon systems. Um, so you can see uh, with the uh, populated and unpopulated states that the band gap uh, decreases as the material gets bigger, which is something we would expect. Um, and so the band gap values themselves are listed in the left table. Um, going from 3.6 down to uh, close to two electron volts. Now, this isn't the only thing um, that can affect uh, the band gaps in the materials. Um, we're also interested in um, how surface functionalization of the material can have uh, this type of electronic structure effect. And so what I'm showing here are band gap values for a range of titanium polyoxotitanate clusters uh, with different surface functionalization. So you can see for the smallest models, um, down for uh, a cluster made up of six titanium. Um, the band gap is up to uh, three electron volts um, and gets a little bit smaller for um, uh, clusters that are made up of, of 14, 17, and 18. And so to go a little bit further um, into this, um, I want to highlight 
two different types of uh, titanium um, pyoxid titanate clusters. So here uh, we're interested in um, a TI-6 system and a TI-17. And the reason uh, we've chosen these two systems is because of uh, the electronic structure due to uh, the specific uh, surface functionalization. So for the TI-6 system, um, it was uh, functionalized with both acetone and propanol. And you can see the density of states for both of these um, shown in the top right. So acetone in blue and propanol in red. And you can see that for the acetone functionalized system, um, it actually has um, population up above uh, the original band gap, um, which is, is more or less producing a band gap of zero um, with minimal energy difference between um, the highest occupied and the lowest unoccupied. With the propanol in the system, there's an open band gap, um, which can be used um, as a semiconductor for um, different types of photo, uh, photocatalysis um, or um, as some type of electrode. On the bottom is a little bit larger with uh, 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 propanol and methanol uh, functionalizations. Um, and so the density states on the right, bottom right shows for propanol, um, there's an open gap similar to there was for the TI-6. However, now with methanol as the functionalization group, um, there's an introduced energy state within the band gap um, that leaves um, a band gap close to um, point, uh, 0 0.57 electron volts. And so this, this newly introduced um, occupied state is gonna um, give us the potential for um, low energy absorptions, which is ideal for titanium uh, dioxide, as um, they're primarily uh, um, have a band gap close to uh, 3.2 electron volts. Um, and it's also going to give us a um, uh, possibility for new uh, relaxation pathways. And so, in looking at um, the cone chomp orbital energy fluctuations and possible charge carrier relaxation um, for the left. Uh, fluctuation image, which is for the TI-6 uh, propanol system, um, you can see that the, the structure stays relatively uh, consistent uh, during the dynamic trajectory, whereas the fluctuations for uh, the TI-17 methanol system, uh, you can see there's there's a very, uh, very large change to one uh, energy fluctuation. So in looking at um, the charge carrier dynamics of the system, um, the bottom four left um, initial conditions correspond to the four strongest um, electronic transitions in the ground state. So there's some type of initial excitation um, uh, going from, say, 155 to 180, that top left panel, um, and then uh, the corresponding relaxations for the hole and the electron um, occur over a time period of um, about 10 picoseconds or sorry, um, about, uh, oh, uh, sorry, it was about 6.5 picoseconds. And so both the electron and hole are uh, found to relax at a very similar uh, rate. And so the charge carrier separation lifetime is not very large. However, if we move to uh, the TI-17 system, um, we're looking at um, excitations that occur uh, or generate a hole in the valence band that now needs to overcome the large subgap um, due to this newly introduced state. And so the electronic uh, relaxation mechanisms uh, you can see occur on a time scale of anywhere from uh, 200 femtoseconds um, to about one picosecond, whereas for any hole generated um, inside the valence band that's not the HOMO, um, it takes a very long time uh, to uh, relax up to the HOMO, um, so you're looking at, um, you know, hundreds, hundreds of picoseconds. Um, so this gives a very large uh, charge separation lifetime uh, for the system. And so having this large uh, lifetime uh, can allow other types of uh, photochemical events, some type of uh, redox reaction to happen, um, potentially on the surface of the material. Um, one of the things that uh, may contribute to this is looking at the partial charge densities um, of the transitions themselves. And so uh, the HOMO and LUMO uh, for the two systems are shown to go from, um, on the HOMO are, are, are localized somewhere on uh, the ligands, whereas the LUMO uh, is localized somewhere 
um, on the titanium core itself. So the majority of these types of transfers are um, classified as uh, metal to, or, uh, um, sorry, from, from uh, ligand to metal type charge transfers um, within the system. And so um, moving now, we want to take a look at uh, a direct comparison of calculations between a bulk and a quantum confined, confined material. And so to do this, we're looking at uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide perovskite materials, um, which are, are uh, newcomers to the photovoltaic game um, and have been um, extensively studied in the last um, eight years. Um, with efficiencies going up to uh, 22%. So to look at the bulk material themselves, um, we're interested in um, a perfect material, um, but we're also interested in uh, the electronic changes that may occur with some type of uh, vacancy change. So the simulation models are shown on the left for the vacated model. So the two-dimensional slice shows a missing lead atom, uh, which is removed from the system. Um, and in a three-dimensional uh, image, it would be right in the middle of that simulation cell. And so um, by removing this type of, well, by removing the lead atom, it produces a number of um, interesting electronic environments. Um, the removal of the lead uh, also removes uh, two valence electrons, uh, which need to be replaced um, into the system. Uh, for the calculation. So we have a, a perfect system for one. Um, our second system is um, just has the lead removed and no charge correction. Uh, the third uh, system has one electron added back in, and then uh, the other system has both, uh, both valence electrons added back into the calculation. Um, and so we're interested in um, how this, diff this changing electronic environment um, will affect the electronic processes in the material. So the top right um, set of panels shows uh, the density of states for the closed shell um, electronic structures. So these are the perfect system, um, the lead vacancy system with no charge correction, and then the lead vacancy with two additional electrons placed into a singlet configuration. And so you can see um, in comparing the pure and the lead vacancy, you can see the introduction of an, a new state in the band gap. Um, and so this new state um, can lower the absorption onset um, but all, and also cause um, relaxation pathways uh, to be um, lengthened as there's going to be a subgap going from the conduction band to this uh, LUMO state. And then in the singlet configuration, you can see that the uh, band edges at the uh, valence band um, push back up, um, which is in agreement with um, the, the uh, charge density being localized on the lead um, and iodine at the band edges within the material. Now, this um, is done in a three by three by three supercell, um, which results in um, a direct band gap um, away from the gamma point um, of the system. And so, um, to correct for this type of, um, well, Jim? well, to show that the yes, Jim? may I interrupt you? So uh, yeah. for for curiosity, when you have bulk perovskite, the lead ions contribute orbitals to the bottom of the conduction band. And you can mention them like five S. Okay. Yeah, I'll put something like this. Um, and 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 here's the question: If you remove one lead ion, you also remove this five S orbitals from the uh, bottom of the conduction band. Why? You observe formation of the trap state in the middle of the gap. What is the hypothetical mechanism of the uh, trap state formation? Do not answer <laughs> now, it may take longer. Okay. So you, okay. so you want to... All right, so you're asking about 
um, with removal of the lead, removal of uh, specific orbitals, um, and why it creates in the in the inside the band gap, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I I'm going to think about that. I'll try to answer it by the end of the end of the presentation. Okay. Um, oh, um, one other thing um, to note here on this slide before I move on. Um, so when we're looking at uh, this vacancy system, um, even with the inclusion of all K points, we still find that the vacancy persists within this band gap. Um, which is something that uh, the reviewers were wanting us to, to share. Um, so because we were looking at how um, the electronic structure varies by uh, K point, um, we did some band structure calculations um, for the system. So here, again, I show band structures for uh, the closed system <clears throat> with um, the perfect, the lead vacancy, and then the charge corrected singlet um, electronic structure. So a couple things to note. So we have um, a flattening of the a flattening of the bands um, as we take away this lead atom um, and the corresponding electrons, um, and we get an even flatter structure uh, once we introduce uh, these uh, two charges back in. Um, but the other thing to note is that um, we have this persistent. Uh, vacancy state that doesn't change much um, as we change uh, between different K points. So regardless of um, where we're taking or uh, calculating these energies, um, we're always going to find this type of structure. And so um, I think I'm going to remove um, this other uh, picture here and, and just have it as extra information. And so uh, because we were looking solely at the gamma point um, and we knew that uh, the band gap energy didn't uh, match up with that of experiment, um, the absorption energies uh, shown on the top also show uh, the absorption onset at a much higher energy um, than we would expect. They correspond with the calculations, but not with experiment. So again, to introduce um, the concept that multiple K points are necessary for the correct electronic spectra. The bottom four right panels um, show K point corrections uh, for the vacancy and the charge corrected state. And so here, uh, the top two have the total absorption spectra, uh, which have their onsets um, 800 to uh, 900, which is um, ideally with what we would want to see. Um, with the bottom two panels showing the individual contributions to absorption by each single K point calculated. Um, for the system. Um, also um, noted is, is the fact that we, we hadn't used uh, spin orbit coupling uh, corrections, which is necessary in these types of materials. And so um, and to, to try and appease uh, some of the reviewers, um, we worked in um, calculating the absorption spectra with spin orbit coupling. And so for the systems, uh, you can see that uh, the spectra themselves uh, don't change much in shape. Um, the, the majority of the change occurs um, only in um, energy shifts. And so when uh, looking at other types of calculations done for the spin orbit coupling, um, we know that uh, different bands at the bottom of the conduction band are going to split, um, reducing the energy um, of one instead of having a degeneracy. And so this is this is one of the things that um, is a primary contributor to uh, the shift in energy. So when looking at uh, the open shell electronic configurations, uh, we're able to look at the alpha and beta spin projections uh, separately and independently um, of one another. So the um, absorption um, is shown with a total uh, spectrum in black and um, alpha and beta as red and blue dashed lines. Um, and the red and blue also correspond to the density of states uh, shown for the structures below. Um, so with the uh, spin up and spin down, you can see that there's a non-symmetric component um, to, to the shape, um, whereas the beta components are showing an empty, unoccupied orbital um, within the system. And so this unoccupied orbital um, will produce dynamics similar to that of just the vacancy uh, closed, 
closed shell system um, as they both have an unoccupied state within the band gap. Now, with the um, addition of uh, multiple K-point calculations, um, the major difference occurs in the shape of the bottom of the conduction band. Um, and so uh, there are extra states um, that are added in um, at the bottom of the conduction band um, that may lead to um, uh, different rates uh, calculated out. So during dynamics um, of the systems, uh, we're able to look at how these energies fluctuate as we have in the past. And so um, for the systems uh, studied, um, there wasn't um, large fluctuations in, in energy amplitude um, for the majority of the systems. However, for the lead vacancy system itself, um, there was um, a drastic change of having um, the LUMO orbital very, very close to the top of the valence band um, and also have a very large fluctuation in energy. And so um, this is something that we looked at um, and we contributed to the formation of an I2 molecule at the vacancy site within the system. And so looking at uh, the dynamics um, of the material um, for all different sets of systems, um, the, the open shell are the top four, um, the bottom three are for the closed system. And so if we start with the closed system, you can see for the pure material, um, the holes are relaxing um, somewhere close to um, a picosecond or less, whereas the electrons are just slightly longer than that, um, which experimentally are expected to be um, anywhere from um, 500 to um, 800 femtoseconds, so it's on the right uh, time scale. Uh, but once we introduce this lead vacancy, uh, you can see that there's a much longer lived electron lifetime uh, promoting uh, this charge carrier separation lifetime. Um, but then when we move back to um, adding the additional electrons to correct for the charge, um, the lifetimes are relatively similar, um, but just shifted uh, to be a little bit longer. For the open system, um, there is uh, some correlation or, or mirroring of what happens in the closed system. Um, for the lead, uh, with one additional electron in the spin up, um, it's similar to that of the pure, um, with electron hole relaxing on similar time scales. Um, but as soon as you look to the beta state, which had the uh, extra unoccupied state, you have a very long lifetime for the electron as it has to uh, move uh, down to the conduction band and then jump the subgap to this LUMO. Um, and then conversely for um, uh, the triplet uh, state emissions, um, there can be uh, variations in subgap for uh, the electrons and holes, um, but still um, uh, for the alpha uh, component um, of the triplet state, there's two additional electrons in, just inside the top of the conduction band. Um, so any type of relaxation of hole is going to have a very large subgap, which is seen um, in blue. Um, whereas for the beta component, um, the time scales for um, the electron and hole are going to have a very long um, hole time scale, or sorry, electron time scale relative uh, to the hole just because of um, um, the unoccupied state um, very, very close to the top of the valence band. And so from these uh, non-radiative calculations, we can also look at the time integrated emission spectra that are produced. Um, and so we have major peaks um, shown for um, band gap energies, uh, which is uh, something we would expect um, as there's no recombination calculated um, once the charges hit the uh, band edges, they uh, stay there until the calculation is done. Um, but one of the um, interesting things for um, the triplet states is that you can still get some strong emission um, across uh, the large uh, subgap in the system, even though um, the electrons uh, can still pop, or well, the homo still populate up into the conduction band slightly. Um, and so the same thing uh, can be said for uh, the beta component of the triplet states where you have um, a small uh, emission peak that's still um, very large. Um, so it's skipping uh, that extra uh, state contributed to the top of the valence band. 
for the closed systems, um, again, you see large uh, peaks at the, um, well, subgap energies um, that are shown and also for uh, the band gap. Um, and then for the singlet state where there's no additional uh, electronic states added in, there's just a large single peak at the homolimo gap. And so here, don't read uh, the tables. Um, you can just listen to my voice. Um, so the, the main, uh, I'm going to take most of these out and just provide a few numbers. The main, the main goal um, from what this table is, um, the, this table provides that the, the non-radiative lifetimes for electrons and holes um, are generally on the order of, you know, um, one to five picoseconds for electrons and less than a picosecond for holes. Um, until you get to systems with uh, newly introduced states, then you have lifetimes that are extremely long, somewhere close to um, 80 picoseconds, 80 to 100 picoseconds. Um, and so um, these varying time scales um, are going to be used to compare with a quantum confined piece of the material um, in a little bit. One of the other things I want to note, though, um, was in looking at these different spin components, uh, we can estimate, um, not predict, but just have, have some rough estimation as to what a quantum yield for that uh, material might be. Um, and so um, with the materials uh, that have um, more or less no additional state within the middle of the band gap, um, you can see for the uh, spin alpha, you can see for the triplets, or the sorry, the singlet, um, and then for the uh, beta uh, triplet state, uh, you can see that there's very large uh, quantum yields. Um, so without having some sort of trap state uh, in the middle, um, you get some uh, relative scales of non-radiative and um, radiative emission. So to do the correct comparison, we also studied a, a spatially confined piece of the material. Um, and what we did was we took uh, just three uh, unit cells and built this um, almost nanoplatelet um, type piece of material. So as it spins, you'll see um, it's kind of almost like a, a three-dimensional triangle type piece. And so looking at um, the ground state structure of the material, uh, we can see that uh, the band gap's at 2.1. Um, which um, for uh, spatially confined materials, we expect that there's, um, there's no dispersion um, and we're looking solely at the, at the gamma point. Um, and so the fact that um, this band gap is greater than the experiment is expected um, compared to the bulk material, which was just shifted away from the gamma point. Um, and so uh, another thing that we wanted to take a look at was um, during optimization of the material, if we start from this cubic structure, um, the cubic structure is known to be the high temperature uh, uh, geometry. And so during optimization, uh, we're going to see some type of restructuring to a, a different um, um, a different uh, geometric phase. And so um, the ground state uh, distributions for the three different phases are shown, um, and then also an overlay of the calculation for, um, sorry, um, along the molecular dynamic trajectory to, main to uh, determine if, uh, if the structural uh, shape was maintained, which it was. Um, and so uh, in looking at or in considering um, multiple different relaxation mechanisms, um, we have, we've already been looking at um, uh, non-radiative relaxation and radiative relaxation. Um, and so when, when we're interested in these types of, of relaxation rates, um, we're looking also at non-radiative recombination. Um, so we're interested in uh, the this, this specific transition from homo-to-lumo uh, compared to other types of, of fast rates. And so um, this rate of uh, radiative combination is, is seen to be on the order of 100 picoseconds, um, shown highlighted in yellow, uh, the transition from uh, LUMO to HOMO. Um, but then we're also interested in 
um, uh, the non-radiative relaxation rates, which as we would expect the, the spacing to increase in the quantum dot, we would expect the non-radiative rates to, to uh, slow down, giving them longer lifetimes relative to um, uh, the bulk material. And so when we look at the time scales for a low and high temperature, um, you can see that for holes in electrons, instead of looking at, you know, um, around one picosecond, now instead we're, we're looking at things that are anywhere from one to 10 picoseconds or five to 10 or, or even higher than that. And so, um, okay. um, there should be a slide about um, the MEG uh, results in there. Um, so in looking at the time scales for these different types of relaxation processes within the quantum dot, um, the calculated rates for the multiplex sun generation um, were somewhere in the scale of 10 femtoseconds, whereas um, radiative um, or luminescence uh, were on the scale of um, both 10 picoseconds and, and um, 100 picoseconds respectively. Uh, but then looking at the non-radiative relaxation and the non-radiative recombination, um, they're on the scale of, you know, about five picoseconds, which was longer than uh, what was calculated for the bulk material. Um, but then the non-radiative is on the order of uh, three nanoseconds, which is, um, we would expect this process to be the slowest. So um, with the slowing of this type of non-radiative process, um, we can give uh, more time for uh, the multiple X time generation, uh, which is a more efficient process, um, time to occur. And so um, in looking at all these systems, uh, we're able to uh, find that by confining different types of semiconductor materials, we're, uh, we can highlight that um, changes in size can um, influence um, uh, the coordination and microstructure of a system, uh, which can then influence the dynamics and uh, the availability for uh, radiative and non-radiative events. Um, we we're also interested in looking at how, uh, due to the spatial confinement, we can find uh, the opening of uh, band gaps. We can find that um, the, the energy discretization um, directly affects non-radiative relaxations um, and also allows for um, spacing to insert um, energy states due to surface functionalization. And so these types of functionalizations can also allow for um, new pathways um, and events to occur, which can be beneficial for photocatalytic or photochemical uh, processes. Um, and we can, uh, we also looked at in the um, bulk uh, Provskat materials, uh, the effect of, of different vacancies and, and the effects on the rates, um, and also in relation to um, confining the material um, and having a slowing of uh, specific mechanisms um, allow more efficient types of mechanisms to uh, promote and be uh, dominant, increasing the uh, possible application of the material. And so um, these are people I'm very thankful for. Um, and I will just end it. Um, okay, there. Thank so. you. Mm -hmm. So what would be the uh, effect if you were able to include excitonic effects on your spectra on like slide eight, I think? Okay. So um, including exciton effects within a material, so you're gonna you're gonna um, end up with changes in uh, relaxation rates. Um, you're going to have um, changes in um, band structure shape and, and energies between them. Um, uh, what do you mean band structure shape? Well, so so um, so if you have some sort of well, so you have a creation of an exciton, right? Um, and so as as somewhere they may 
well, maybe that's not the right way to put it. Um, so depending on, on the spatial confinement, right, if you get them uh, somewhere reasonably close, you can have a, a larger overlap of the two uh, exton particles. And so you would have some type of faster radiative transition, um, right? Because if you have a larger wave function overlap, you're going to have a larger or a larger oscillator strength. Okay, but what did you mean by band? Is well, when I was in... people call in vast band as a molecular orbital. Right. When I, I guess when I was thinking about it, so if, if you're looking at band edges, um, like the Van Span conduction band, uh, some type of, of, like some type of added, uh, columbic attraction can sometimes bend, bend the valence and conduction band, um, slightly. So you're energy. talking like a PN junction. Mm, sure. Well, I don't see connection to PN junction. Uh, if you take P and junction, you just mean it. Well, yeah. Band bending. Yes. Yeah. So, will you have the same energy range for your ex uh, absorption, or will it redshift or blue shift? I would expect it mm, for absorption. I, don't, I would expect it to maybe redshift a little bit. And then do you think every transition would redshift systematically or would it also depend on the nature of that state? Mm, I would I would I would say it probably depends on the nature of that state. So in your perovskite material, has anyone shown that excitonic effects only shift it systematically, or has no one looked at like T to the FT to look at the excitation? Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember, but I know like Amanda has done exciton calculations in perovskite materials. Um, so I can, I can definitely look at that okay. um, readily, but. Oh. We, we, we all need to ask John and uh, for his interest, but I am impatient to answer to the uh, If you noticed, absorption spectra that John computed with and without spin orbit coupling, they do have an offset of about 1 eV. So influence of spin orbit coupling is much stronger in this material than uh, formation of bound exciton. And uh, do you have spin orbit coupling included in uh, Gaussian variability. So you see, it is possible, but not, not easy. Uh, please keep asking, John. I have a question as far as application mm -hmm. goes. So, what part of a solar cell that we currently use would this replace? Would it replace a part of a current solar cell, or would it redefine solar cells altogether? Um, so you, are you referring to the perovskite materials? Yes. Okay. Um, so um, the perovskite materials themselves would be the photoactive material within the within the cell. So the material that's absorbing um, the light and then um, separating the charges. Um, I mean, the materials themselves are known to be able to separate the charges and migrate them uh, separately within without any type of transport layer. Um, so it, it's just um, having a material that has a band gap that's, you know, 1.6 to 1.7. Um, um, and then you can stack whole and electron transport layers on top of it um, relative to, so I mean, so silicon is, is what, 1.1, I think, for a band gap energy. Um, and if you look at like shockley quasar efficiency values, I think um, the maximum efficiency, the max, the highest efficiency possible for a material has a band gap of, uh, I want to say maybe like in the range 1.2 to 1.4 maybe. Um, I would have to go back and look at that plot again. Um, but no, so it, it's just a, it's a material used as a photoactive material that's easy to make 
well, relatively easy and, and cheap to make. Um, and Aaron can head knows a little bit about this now that he's trying to um, build these types of cells. So. Okay, so you wouldn't have to redefine solar cells from the ground up. You'd be able to replace. No, no. It's just it's, um, you could use um, silicon as a photoactive material, which is primarily what most of the industrial uh, panels are made out of. You could take that out and put perovskite in, um, and then just you. I mean, you'd have to change a little bit of of um, the materials for collecting uh, and separating the charges, but it would. It's pretty much a substitution. Cool. Would you have to change the work function of the ca uh, the contacts? Um, I I would have to look at the exact device design. Um, I mean, I would assume so because you want some type of bias driving um, the charges to to the right electrodes um, for them to be collected. That's okay. We're kind of not engineers, right? <laughs> yeah. Gold is the best. Gold companies give the highest efficiency. Cheap. <laughs> more, more questions, or objections, or comments. Yeah, I mean, uh, probably his talk was more than one hour, right? Have you? Look at it. Agile. Yeah. Maybe you have to cut some part of it because it's kind of too long. Yeah, that's um, it's shorter than it was last time. Um, but it's... <laughs> so last time it was two hours or <laughs> last, Well, we last, ran out of time. time. John uh, went only over half of the talk and we spent two hours. <laughs> yeah. Granted, we did have questions during, but no, there's. Um, there's a few things I'm going to take out um, and I'm going to redo just to highlight some of the more important things and, and maybe not worry about the details. Um, One place that you could probably cut a lot of time is the slide before all the, the tables because I think you've spent like at least five minutes going over every figure. Uh, oh, and I'm yeah. not sure if that is that important because you have so much information on that slide. Yeah. Okay, so that was slide 34. Uh, five? I, 35, I think. Yeah, you probably don't have to go into the d details and several slides. Just okay. So if I, would, if I would give a general description that there are classes of transitions that have an extra state and there are transitions that don't, that would be, ben that would be sufficient. Yeah, if, if there was one yeah. out of here that does, you could say, if we okay. look at these specific type, boil it down and say, these have two transitions, these have whatever, like oh. intermediate. I don't, I, it's hard to see, it's kind of small on the paper. Yep. <laughs> also, maybe yeah. slide 10, when you talk about heating and molecular dynamics, um, you went really in depth on that as well. Maybe you could cut that down, the explanation of it, cut that down maybe. Okay. Just because there's, there's so much literature on it that I think that it would be okay to do that. Not everyone's an expert like you, Dave. Well, I'm not, you know, but <laughs> could always look it up, Google it. Oh, and uh, on slide 15, if I can make one suggestion, you have a blue box with black writing. If those colors don't mean anything to you, I'd recommend maybe changing the blue to green or the black writing to white writing. Okay. Well, I I might just take those out okay. um, because it, they're not really necessary. They're just they're just there. Uh, so I have a conceptual question on fourteen. Um, okay. What type of basis are you in? Are you in diabetic or adiabatic? For for, let's see, for 14. So, um, so these calculated along an adiabatic molecular dynamic trajectory. So does the monitoring the band itself influence your uh, electronic dynamics or is it totally 
then just it does not matter about the band, even though you may have band indexes switch right, because right. of the so fluctuation. There, there's, there's there's definitely going to be some indice switching um, happening, um, but the way um, well, so it's so it's an average over the trajectory, and um, so it, but to answer your short question, no, or short answer is no. Um, that's not taken into account that there could be indice switching. It's just kept as um, you know, state one to state two. And then, what causes the bands to fluctuate at different rates? Because if everything fluctuated mm -hmm. at one, you would have a single right. function. But here, yeah. Okay. So, um, right. So, we, when we're so the solutions that produce or result in the Cohn-Sheim orbitals and their corresponding energies, right? So you can you can image the Cohn-Sheim orbital through some type of partial charge density, and so looking at the localization and which atoms and orbitals are contributing to say that molecular orbital hybridization. Um, so if you have, um, you know, um, one hydrogen stretching um, rapidly on one side of the system and another one stretching at a slower rate, if that cone orbital is localized on the fast stretching, you're gonna have a large energy fluctuation. Whereas if you have something localized on a, a different, a slower stretching, the energy probably won't fluctuate as much. So in other words, it's electron phonon coupling. It's yeah, the nuclear nuclear effect on the energies. So on slide thirty two for your absorption spectra. Mm -hmm. Comparing spin orbit coupling and spin polarized. Okay. So for the first the one where you charge it with one electron and two, it looks like mm -hmm. both of them have the same absorption between spin orbit and spin polarization. So is there a reason why behind that? Oh, so you're comparing um, images from slide 31 and slide 32? Uh, no, just 32. 32 so, okay. Is, John? Slide yes. 32, lowest, yep. lowest uh, row, image number three, which is labeled with letter C. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. My slide numbers are different in this version. Um, oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're looking. We're looking here. Can you see my screen again? This is this yes. is what we're looking at. Yeah. Okay. So you're asking why those two absorption spectras look the same? Yes. Which ones are we looking at? A, B, C, D. C so we're looking at B, C. Or just C. So so B, B is there's no it's not a spin polarized it's just um, a spin on spin restricted. There's no additional electrons here, so it's a singlet. C is a one electron um, spin polarized system. It's a doublet. Um, and so, um, the of the yeah. yeah, so, so, well, so I guess what exactly, what is exactly your question now? So like, if you look at around like one EV, yep. it kind of looks like that both spin orbit coupling and spin polarized transitions mm -hmm. occur there. Right. So, so within this, um, one additional, um, electron state, if we look at the density of states for the spin polarized, right, we see that the alpha component looks pretty normal, but the beta component has um, an unoccupied state, um, like here. So you can see, you can see that there's an unoccupied state here at about 1.5 EV. So that low energy band um, absorption band for the beta is is somewhere occurring from somewhere in the valence band to here, um, but also because the spin orbit coupling um, takes into account you know the alpha and beta spin mixing into its orbitals, it's going to have 
some component of, of beta taken into account, meaning that um, if we would look at the density of states for the spin orbit coupling, I would also expect to see some type of unoccupied band um, just above the valence band, somewhere that would correspond to about the same type of absorption energy, right? Because um, here, right, yeah. So, so when we have um, this this wave function for this, uh, the spin orbit coupling, it's comprised of the two components um, for up and down. Um, does that does that make sense? Or, yeah, or maybe... somewhat. I guess my initial thought was just since it's a vacancy, it's just a dangling iodide bond. So like spin mm. over coupling wouldn't contribute to that. Well, it would be negligible compared to okay. if it was a lead. Or okay. So... Well, and and so so that that could also be uh, to the point where um, so. Uh, there was a question about where, so if you remove that lead atom, you're also removing the the orbitals for possible, um, excuse me, uh, for possible uh, electronic population. Um, so it could be that if if it's the case where um, because we remove this uh, lead electron, the vacancy isn't or is then pushed to um, uh, somewhere off of lead. That's still well. It's still in the system somewhere. That even with the spin orbit coupling, it could still manifest itself. But maybe maybe someone else has a better idea too. Yeah, I'm. I don't know. I'm not satisfied, but I'm not sure where the disagreement lies. So yeah, I'm not really sure what to say. Will it be possible to generalize and tell that there is a class of states or class of excitations when uh, spin polarized and spin orbit qualitatively coincide and then we can reduce computational cost and do everything with spin polarized it will be very pleasant very helpful but uh, hard to believe at, at least in this um, specific case they coincide and if you would have more states we can prove a theorem like forget spin orbit, do old good spin polarized. <laughs> hmm? do, you, do you have something to add? Mm, I guess maybe not right now. I will write him an email because I have a lot of questions. Okay, so if you. Uh, <laughs> that, that's right. So uh, please consider to. Um, scan and send your questions to John. If you do not feel enough steam to scan, you can give it, say, to me, and I will scan. But then he will answer thank you only to me. If you send it personally, you will get a <laughs> personal thank you. And also, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a question to to John. We started to discuss it, but it was not yet shaped out. How to help audience to navigate? What connects different parts? Would uh, most of us were witnessing the defense by Brendan Gifford, and at the later stages of, uh, of later uh, drafts of his thesis, he made a map that helps audience to navigate. So can you just uh, consider the flow chart that will make like lines connecting and explaining uh, what the parts are. While listening to I, I did try to do something, but I can be very uh, wrong. So you, you are the author, I, I can just suggest. So one flow chart is for um, <laughs> methods. Mm -hmm. So you have three big blocks, you throw in atomistic model, then another big uh, block is uh, of initial calculations of different DFT, molecular dynamics and uh, Redfield, and then it gives uh, three types of observables. So this way you mimic uh, 
the experimental instrument and replace a whole big lab with just a set of, uh, with a cluster, with the right software. And another thing, you may connect which models you touched. And again, I can be wrong, mm -hmm. but you have most of them are quantum dots. And find perovskite silicon and uh, uh, titanium dioxide. And also for perovskite, you have uh, bulk, and for titanium dioxide, you did some nanowires and uh, and bulk or surfaces before, but you don't cover them in, in physics. But maybe, well, try to think to help audience to follow simple map, simple road through this. Uh, long thesis or long presentation. Are there more, more questions? Uh, John? Please. Oh, uh, do we have other stuff after this or? No. Okay. Uh, so on uh, where you have the broccoli plots, mm -hmm. why does the smaller systems vary a whole bunch more, even though on your methodology slide, you use stat thermo to say that the sum of the kinetic energy is equal to three halves uh, N Boltzmann factor times temperature. Wouldn't that mean that everything is scaled similarly? Therefore, you should not get more displacement in the small systems compared to the large systems? So, um, so one answer to that question is um, directly relating to our interest in the microstructure and how the percentage of surface atoms change as you keep shrinking the silicon nanocrystal. So for the smallest crystal, you have the highest percentage of silicon atoms somewhere on the surface. And so these are the silicon atoms that have an under coordination. Um, so they're either coordinated to two or three silicon atoms instead of four. And so you have a larger, well, you have a less rigid silicon atom at lower coordination numbers, allowing for larger fluctuations in atomic position. Does that make sense? Like if you if you have a really big piece of material and you and you hit it, the atoms in the center aren't going to move at all. But if you hit whatever you hit on the um, surface is, is going to have the greatest movement. So. So what you're saying is the surface potential is lower than the core potential. What, what do you define as potential? So if yeah. you move the atom, it's easier to move the outside than the core. Because then that yeah. would go directly into our, the derivative of our... That's right. Right, the velocity. Surface atoms, the velocity they have of less uh, bonds. They okay. have more, more yeah. degrees of freedom. They can move sterically in all uh, dimensions. That's right. And the, the bulk atoms are confined, and they can do only small oscillations. That's right. That's, that's what Physically, it makes great, sense. Great answer, John. I didn't think about that. <laughs> okay. I was wondering, the slide 24 or 25, I don't remember. This uh, functionalization, the surface functionalization, why the sure. propanol has the smallest uh, band gap, I mean, in the case of the propanol, the titanium 17. Uh, there, is a, um, there is a table. Right, right, right. So, uh, okay, so because the, um, oh, that could be because I mislabeled it. <laughs> I bet that is exactly what it is. <laughs> um, that sh sorry, that that should be methanol. I have the propanol methanol numbers mixed up uh, because the okay. the density of the methanol. If you look at the density of states, it shows you know that occupied state close to the conduction band, whereas the propanol is open. That's that's. Thank you for pointing that out. That was my mistake. Uh, defense is canceled. <laughs> <laughs> As you said, we've got about one minute, if my memory serves correct. Yeah. Good talk. Thank you for the yeah. yeah. But so I we, can always... We are, we are going to get cut. I, I don't remember either in one minute or in 11 minutes. But the connection will... Uh,
uh, will be disconnected by mm -hmm. how, how the stopwatch is set up by, by your university. call will be disconnected oh. Okay, one minute. Okay, thank John once again. Thanks, guys. It almost sounds like you're not going to a Dimitri. I heard.